All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Cotaverdian. I'm organizing lead for Generation Ratify. I am also a climate activist, so I'm hub coordinator for Sunrise LA Youth, which is a youth-led environmental activism movement, and we're working towards ratifying the Green New Deal. So with that, I would like to welcome you guys to the webinar. I'm honored to be facilitating this webinar, which is part of a series of five webinars titled Rethinking Sisterhood, the role of media in affirming the ERA that will be running Thursday afternoon, every Thursday afternoon from May 7th to June 4th. The role of these webinars is to bring together activists, artists, political leaders, as well as interested public to discuss the ways in which the media and citizens around the country can come together to shine light upon the significant efforts being made right now to turn the ERA into the Constitution's 28th Amendment. This installment is the fourth in the series. The three speakers, a state senator, an activist lawyer and academic, and a feminist filmmaker, all have been active in recent years in ensuring passage of the ERA. A highly informed discussion about the necessity of the amendment and the current hurdles it must still confront will unfold. We encourage all of you to be posting throughout the webinar. Our Instagram is at Generation Ratify. Our Twitter is at Gen Ratify. And to use the hashtag ERA2020. And we will repost. Before I introduce the panel, I would like to thank Agnes Films, directed by women, Equal Means Equal, Media Equity, and Women Occupy Hollywood for organizing this alongside Generation Ratify. Now, for the panelists, we have Kamala Lopez, a Los Angeles-based filmmaker, actress, political activist, writer, director, and founder and president of Equal Means Equal. And we have two videos to share for you guys today. All right, looks like... All right, before we do that, let me introduce the rest of the panelists. So we have Wendy Murphy, an adjunct professor of sexual violence law at New England Law in Boston. As an impact litigator, her work in state and federal courts around the country has changed the law to improve protections for women's and children's constitutional rights. And we have State Senator Pat Spearman, a state senator in Nevada, as well as an American cleric and a veteran. She has been a leader on LGBTQ rights, economic development, veteran affairs, and health care. In 2017, she led Nevada's effort to be the 36th state to pass the ERA. So we're going to have everyone speak of their experiences. So I would like to invite Kamala to start us off to speak on her experience. Well, first of all, I want to start by saying thank you to the organizers for making this possible and to congratulate all of you who are here today, who are listening, all the women that have worked so tirelessly for this day to, her, to have arrived. We have achieved the 38 states needed. It was a battle that took almost 100 years, but I want to plant our flag down here today and congratulate ourselves and just understand that what we've done is mammoth. You know, um, people stopped working on the ERA in 1982 and up until about 2009 or so, that's, that's when I came, I, I uh, learned about it again. There really wasn't a lot of focus on getting the last three states because there was consensus that this deadline was valid. There were women that came along in 1994 that wrote a paper about it and said, you know what, there, there's nowhere in the Constitution where it says this. And in fact, they've just ratified an amendment that took them 200, over 200 years. How could they only give women seven and give the Congress pay raises over 200 years? So it sort of started it up again, but for some reason, there was not consensus that this was the direction to go in. So I want to applaud the access on the ground in all of the states that have worked so hard, not just Nevada, Illinois, Virginia, but Utah, but North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, um, all of the women in the country that have been out there um, it is because of you that we are standing here able to have this conversation. Because until we got to 38, it was all academic. And now we're going to get to the bottom of this. 
So I just want to also give a shout out to Carolyn Cook, a woman that I met, I don't know now, maybe 15 years ago, who told me about the three state strategy. And she told me there was no consensus and nobody would do it. And I couldn't understand why. And Carolyn, you were right. And a special shout out to Zoe Nicholson, my godmother, who has been holding the torch for ERA since the 70s. I mean, she was one of the activists in Illinois that did a fast for 37 days for the Equal Rights Amendment, and it still didn't happen in Illinois. And to Roberta France, Bobby France, who has kept the ERA action website. So for a that has fought so long and hard, we won, okay? We won, we did it, congratulations. Women are now equal under the United States Constitution. Take a deep breath, pat yourself on the back, and now get ready for the next fight. And the next fight is the one where they tell you, guess what? We're gonna move the goal and we're gonna tell you that you didn't win. And we're gonna gaslight you and tell you you're not equal and keep you in the same second class citizen position for another two, three, five, ten decades because, you know, it's easier for us. It's better for us economically. We don't really wanna deal with rape and sexual assault. We don't wanna deal with paying people properly. So we're just gonna push this aside again. And you know what? We are here today to say, no, you're not. No, you're not. We're gonna win this lawsuit. And we're going to make sure that the Equal Rights Amendment is certified, adopted, and enforced. And that's, uh, that's my spiel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kamala. And with that, we're going to show two clips from Kamala Lopez. this country is hitting a crisis point, whether we're going to progress on women's issues or whether we're going to regress. I set off across the country. I'm taking a snapshot of where we are as Americans on the issue of equal rights. We're put in a position at odds with our usual position, which is moving ahead so we could get equal rights. Instead, we're having to fight to retain rights we won 30 years ago. The biggest force against us at the moment is the propaganda saying it's over. The war on women is shameless, baseless propaganda. There's no fact to it, but it's worked because it scared women to death. Enough, enough. Is there a war on women? And if there is, what does it look like? I decided to take a look, one issue at a time. This really is a war against women. You have the attacks on women's reproductive health care, and then you have this, this onslaught of slashing all these programs. Most women in this country believe in general they're protected under the Constitution, and that is, that is not the reality. A constitutional amendment is a guarantee. If you have a bad election, they can't take away your rights. It's the guarantee from one generation to the next. Women don't have that. If women would unite and use their votes to encourage people to support it, it would pass overnight. We're 53% of the population. It's our time to have wage equality once and for all and equal rights for women in the United States of America. The Equal Rights Amendment, it's a matter of principle. This nation stands for. Men want two things. They want sex. They want their own babies. That's such a, a sexist statement about a male human being. They're still yapping about women not getting the same pay as men. Women like to marry a man who learns more than they do. <laughs> All right, we 
have one more video clip. So just to say that was um, what we used to raise money and awareness to finally make this. Time ran out for the Equal Rights Amendment today. The 24-word statement pledging equality for women fell three states short of ratification. Women and men still do not have equal rights. There's no guarantee against discrimination. If you can pay a woman less than a man, then that's a huge savings to a company. We're not talking about a glass ceiling here. We're talking about a brick wall. Mothers are much less likely to be recommended for management positions. The laws that I thought were going to protect me didn't. Women are the means of reproduction. If we didn't have wounds, we would be fine. We thought that the birth control issue was settled. It is far from settled. Because our reproductive destiny is our economic destiny. It will affect our health outcomes and our economic outcomes for our, us and our children for the rest of our lives. How can it be our country has more homeless women and children than any other industrialized nation? Unless they are economically autonomous, all other aspects of empowerment will be defeated. He pulled the gun out and he held it to my throat and he told me that I was going to die that day. The police do not respond sometimes to violence against women in the same way that they respond to other crimes. And we're being arrested at greater rates than we used to be arrested for. We have something like 35% of all the female prisoners in the world. A 13-year-old child was arrested for prostitution. Rape is the most common violent crime on American college campuses today. The victims are afraid to come forward. Perpetrators know they can get away with it. I don't know what it's going to take for people. Those are our girls. This is our, these are our daughters. This is why it's very important for us to be aware of who our lawmakers are and how much they're prioritizing women. Wow, beautiful. Thank you so much, Pamela. That was so powerful. Now I would like to invite Wendy Murphy to speak on her experiences. Thank you so much and um, thanks to the organizers. It's just such an important issue, but it's also an important moment in time. Um, Pamela mentioned on behalf of Equal Means Equal and the Yellow Roses, a student run a ERA activist group in Massachusetts and another young woman, Catherine Whitebreck, um, we filed a lawsuit in Massachusetts federal court uh, a few months ago uh, asking the court to declare the ERA the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution because a sufficient number of states have ratified. That lawsuit is now pending and our brief is due Monday and I want to encourage everyone watching to please read the brief. We are going to post it the minute we file it with the court. But the reason I want the brief out there, among other things, is to make sure people understand what's at stake and how powerful our legal, our legal arguments are in favor of our position, which is that the ERA is now the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, it bothers me, frankly, that the media not all of the media, but some propaganda uh, has misled us to believe that the area is dead, even though we just ratified the last state when Virginia voted in January of this year. Um, the Mrs. program was exactly that kind of damage by the idea that it died in 1982. That's absolutely not true. We are fighting in the courts because we have very strong arguments that it did not die in 1982. And we need support of the public. It's very difficult to get the support of the public with propaganda campaigns disseminating misinformation about whether the E is in fact valid. So I want to say that by way of introduction. Um, I also want to talk about invisibility because the title of our talk today um, was centered around this notion of invisibility and a big, a big part of my work in the past 30 years has been around fighting this concept of the invisibility of women's suffering, the invisibility of women's rights, the invisibility of women's voices. Uh, propaganda is part of that, but it's, but it's even more deep and dark and problematic 
uh, and I want to share just a couple of ideas with you about how invisibility has happened in the context of both Title IX and the ERA. Uh, I also want to say that, you know, I, I think I'm going to use the, the language woman and women. Uh, this is not meant to be exclusionary. We clearly believe, and I think most people would agree, that the ERA will protect all persons, LGBTQ, whatever. And the reason we believe that is not only because it's a rational approach to thinking about the law, but it's also that when women were excluded from protection under the 14th Amendment in the 1800s, uh, they were the only category of people intentionally left out. It's not like uh, the framers and the, the people who were proposing the 14th Amendment said, um, let's exclude women but include gay people. I mean. LGBTQ didn't even exist. Talk about an, inv an invisibility problem. So I think what we have to focus on is not so much being binary about it, but understanding that there's a history of using the word woman or women, and it's in the law, it's in our conversations, it's in our history, but it is by no means meant to be exclusionary. I want to say that by, by way of introduction to what I'm about to say, because a lot of what the law talks about now is binary. And that's not our that's not our doing. That's the laws. Um, the first thing about Title IX that I want to mention in terms of invisibility is that Title IX and the ERA became part of our national legal conversation and our landscape in 1972 around the same time. They were passed. The ERA was proposed by Congress, and ERA was uh, Title IX was enacted by Congress within months of each other. I mean, this was the product of the civil rights movement, and this is what women won, frankly, in, in terms of what Washington was doing at the federal level. Uh, and both of those laws were designed to do the same sort of thing. Title IX was giving women equality and protection against discrimination in education, and ERA was giving women equality and protection against discrimination in larger society. We kind of got Title IX as a partial um, win, if you will, in the special venue of education, while the ERA was then sent to the states in 1972 for ratification. So while we waited, waited around for equality everywhere, we were at least given this incredibly important guarantee of equality in education. And then pretty quickly, which I, I think is one of the most un misunderstood but most important aspects of how Title IX didn't do that for us, is the fact that it became propagandized almost instantly as a sports equity law. It's one of the reasons I didn't think it applied to me when I was in school, because I don't play sports. Well, that was the big lie that put Title IX on a track against the interests of women. We, we stopped talking about it as a civil rights law, even though that is what it is. It was mirrored to match Title VI, which at that time provided the same rights based on race and national origin. Title IX was simply meant to say the way you treat race and national origin is how you have to treat sex. Well, that didn't happen because Title IX became derailed by propaganda and began, began to be treated as a sports equity law. So of course, if you thought it was only a sports equity law, you as a victim of sexual assault or any other kind of discrimination in education wouldn't even know you had rights that had been violated. That was a problem for decades under Title IX. Um, and it remained a problem until I filed a successful case against Harvard in 2002, and then some more successful cases against Harvard Law School and Princeton University in 2010. Those cases were designed to help teach the public about the relationship between Title IX and sexual assault and other forms of sex-based harm on college campuses. I then sent those cases in 2010 to the Department of Education's headquarters in Washington, DC, and I said, with some help from amicus writers around the country, please issue some kind of global guidance because the problems at Harvard and Princeton are systemic in higher education, and they were. And the Department of Education agreed, and in 2011 issued the now famous Dear Colleague Letter, April 2011 Dear Colleague Letter. Well, guess what? Higher ed hated the Dear Colleague Letter. They did not want to treat women as equals. They did not want to treat sex-based harm the same as race-based harm. So what did they do? They went to Congress, they went to the Department of Education, and they worked for years to change the law to weaken Title IX. And that's how we ended up with the Betsy DeVos regulations that just came out a few weeks ago. That's where they came from. 
Betsy DeVos isn't the bad guy. She's just doing what she's told. I don't even think she has a clue, frankly, what she's doing. She's doing what she's being told to do. And now we have Title IX, weakened regulations, and frankly, a little bit more awareness about why the weakening of Title IX matters. I mean, people are angry, so we're talking about it. There are lawsuits flying. I filed a lawsuit several years ago against Betsy DeVos, also on behalf of Equal Means Equal and others, to stop her from doing what she was doing, which was issuing these guidance rules and regulations to try to weaken a federal statute that gives women equality and protection against discrimination on par with race and national origin. The same thing the ERA does for larger society. And now we've gone backwards? I mean, we won equality under Title IX in education in 1972, and now in 2020, we don't have it? That is unconscionable, but it's where we are. And it's important to understand a little bit about how we got there. The propaganda was a big part of it, but not understanding that women have civil rights, civil rights being a critically important phrase here, matters because. The magic of civil rights laws is they create legal injury in the collective, not only the individual victim, the community. Why does that matter? Because when the community feels injured, the community has skin in the game and they get involved in real solutions. It's why I feel injured when any kind of racist event happens, even though I'm obviously not black, I know racism is harmful to me as a member of the community. I rise up. Nobody rises up as a community for women because we don't give them the respect under civil rights laws that they not only deserve, but won back in 1972. It's not that I think it's a good idea. We actually won in 1972. And now it's being taken away. We have to understand what's being taken away. It has nothing to do with the silliness about Betsy DeVos is letting the perpetrators cross-examine victims. That's the silliness of the narrative. Here's the real narrative you're not reading. Here's what DeVos actually took away. No longer do the regulations prohibit separate and different treatment based on sex. They did back in the 70s when the first regulations came out. It was illegal to subject women and sex-based harms to different or worse treatment. It is now legal. Women have been denied now, for the first time since Title IX's enactment, equitable redress. That's gone. We now live under a regime where Title IX not only allows, but mandates second-class treatment of women and sex-based harm. How did we get here? And why is that not the focus of our, our collective conversation? Why are we talking about these silly things like, can the perpetrator cross-examine the victim? Talk about equality. Equality, that's all. That's all that matters. One quick talk, a quick uh, shift to the Equal Rights Amendment, if you don't mind. Tell me when my time is up because I'm not looking at a clock. Please somebody put their hand up. Um, the invisibility around ERA that I want to focus on is, is, I think, something else that's not well known, but really important. When we won the ERA in 1972, in terms of it getting proposed by Congress and then sent to the states for ratification, the Supreme Court of the United States was doing some interesting, interesting things of its own that we don't talk about. In 1971, for the first time ever, aware that women were rising up, because we were, not, we were not even persons under the 14th Amendment, in 1971, the Supreme Court gave us personhood in Reed versus Reed. They said, women are persons under the 14th Amendment. We're gonna give them protections. But they gave us the lowest level of protection, what's called rational basis scrutiny. They basically said we were the same as, you know, rocks and trees. Women were not. <laughs> We started fighting for the ERA, and it was passed in 1972, which is a great thing, because under the ERA, that rational basis scrutiny would be elevated to what it is when race and national origin discrimination happens. It's called strict scrutiny. Basically, when you have strict scrutiny, no discrimination is tolerated by the courts, none. If you have that lower tier scrutiny, a lot of discrimination is tolerated. Virtually all of it is tolerated. So we were down there, we deserve to be up here, and the ERA was going to take us there. That was the plan. 
Well, in 1972, as the ERA is on its way to ratification by the states, what happened? The United States Supreme Court took a case called Frontero versus Richardson. In Frontero versus Richardson, which was decided in 1973, the Supreme Court gave women strict scrutiny in a four judge plurality decision. They gave us strict scrutiny. Guess what happened? Took the air out of our balloon on ERA because it was a lot harder to argue to the states that they should ratify the ERA because we didn't need it. The Supreme Court had just given us strict scrutiny. What did we need more than that? Then what happened three years later, as they've taken some of the air out of our balloon on ratifying in the states, they decide another case called Craig versus Boren, 1976, and they took strict scrutiny away. Gave us what they called, completely created out of nowhere, intermediate scrutiny. Lower than strict, above rational basis, but crappy scrutiny, let's be clear. And that's where we stand today. I mention this because what the court did really hurt our momentum. It's part of why ERA never made it to the 38 states. There were shenanigans and strategies going on in all branches of government to undermine our efforts. And I'm very happy to say that today, all these years later, we have fought back against those strategies. We are now in federal court. We are now arguing that we've waited long enough we are pointing out all the areas in law where the hypocrisy and the discrimination and the grotesque maltreatment of women has led to massively high rates of violence and abuse and five women dying every day because they are not equal is unacceptable. Please join us in this fight for the ERA. We are very close to the finish line. Thank you. Thank you so much. So sorry to cut you off, but thank you so much for speaking upon your experiences, Wendy. All right, now I want to call upon State Senator Spearman to talk about her experiences. Um, wow, well, um, Wendy's passion is very hard to uh, follow, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, thank you all for your work. Uh, I, I just wanna say this because I believe that the events that we saw this weekend horrific events that we saw this weekend, a display of uh, racism and unbridled bigotry are disconnected from our fight uh, to get the ERA ratified. Uh, one of the things that we have to understand is that those people who have for years benefited from um, their, uh, their quote, ascent just because of gender primarily, and I, I'm very conscious, I use gender because whenever you say sex, people's heads explode uh, because they, don't, they still don't get it. So, so for those people who, who have lived in privilege and do not want that to go away, because that would mean that they would have to compete on equal footing, uh, what we're seeing here is a last gasp of trying to hold on to power. Uh, this past weekend, um, we celebrated my son's graduation from high school and my one of my nephews, uh, everybody came together. And uh, one of my great nephews, he's three years old and he's learning to talk and he's talking pretty good for the most part, but sometimes he can't think of the words he wants to say. And when he can't think of the words he wants to say, he says, <clears throat> and, and I asked, I said, David, what's, what is he doing? What is he doing? And he said, that, that's, that means that he can't, he can't find the words that he wants to say. Uh, or he can't, he can't form the sentence that he wants to say. And so the other thing that we're starting to see uh, very prominently uh, is that ignorance is unabashedly. Uh, in the 21st century, there are still people who cannot form the sentence uh, that say that there is diversity in ethnicity and that all people are created equal, even if you uh, disagree with what I say. And so what they do is they resort to the N-word. And the N-word, uh, that's a clear sign to me that they do not have command of the English language, number one. And number two, uh, they, they are intellectually challenged, if you will, because everyone knows that when you use that word, uh, it is a public admission 
of your lack of intelligence. So let me just say that first, okay? And when we, when we start talking about the ERA, some people wanted to know why, why I was so committed to getting it uh, ratified here in Nevada. And I always say this, you know, I'm African American and I'm proud of that. I'm a woman, I'm proud of that. And I'm a member of the LGBTQ community and I'm proud of that. And you have to be a Disney character to be more marginalized than me. When I walk into the room, I challenge everyone's perception of what equality is at every level. You cannot put your eyes on me without being challenged about how you feel about African Americans. You cannot be uh, help but be challenged about how you feel about women as gender. You cannot be uh, put your eyes on me without understanding that you're now challenged to understand that 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 it's okay to have diversity in gender expression, and so. So my, what I bring to this fight, number one, is a passion for equality. Because when my womanist is free and my womanist has equality, so does my blackness. So does my queerness. And, and, and I don't divorce any part of me from this fight. And, and, and when I look around and I see the, the, the un- that on, as I said before, it's a, it's a the last gasp of what I call hetero patriarchal aerial Aryan view of the world, which means that unless you're you can't see so so we're seeing just a display of of injustice, but we're seeing in form of either written attack people and so I just want to say that or my watching if you use the n-word if you use things would uh bash I was born for this fight and I believe that that's why God gave me a triad when you start talking about who I am and who I represent. I'm black, I'm a woman, and I'm a lesbian. That's why God built me like this because I now become a triple threat to racism, homophobia, and sexism. And guess what? I've got the alphabets behind my name to bring the receipts and you can't shut me up. And so, you know, Wendy talks about, you know, what's going to happen in court, and, and she's much smarter than, than, with that than I am. But, but here's the deal, y'all. Anybody that's listening or looking, okay, I'm ready for the fight. I'm ready for the fight because it's time out for allowing people a pass when they show their ignorance and display sexism or racism or homophobia. It's time out for giving them a pass. And we, collectively, level of government they're in, okay? It's time now to call them out. One of the things that I hope we will do in calling folks out, I hope we have already completed the 2020 census. And every woman, everyone especially, and every ethnic uh, majority, every ethnic emerging majority ought to have completed the census because you know what? We need to make sure that folks know we're here. We gotta make sure people know we're here because what they've done in, in the invisible argument, if you will, comes in and says, well, you know, there aren't that many women, all right? Uh, go back and check the math. We're gonna fill this in because we're gonna be counted. The next thing we're gonna do is we're going to look not just at what people have said, but we're gonna look at what they've done. And when we go to vote this November, we're gonna vote at the top of the No longer will you smooth us, no longer will you bamboozle us, no longer will you just come around and act, act like we're someone who could be bought. We're going to vote from the top of the ticket, from the president, all the way down to the local elections. And we're going to do that strategically. And so guess what? Here is what I want to say to those who have been sitting on, you have your foot or your knee in my neck. And I think RBG talked about about the foot on the neck, but we've seen, you know, the other way that people try to cut off the oxygen in what we say and how we say it is to put the knee in the neck. I'm being very deliberate when I say this, okay? And, and we are going to vote and people who have put their foot or their knee on our neck, make no mistake about it. Virginia has already shown you 
And if you can't get a clue from Virginia, we're getting ready to vote you out. You will go home and you will also go down in history as being one of the ones who was intellectually challenged, could not put your words into view, and one of the ones who history said, we will now throw you to the heat pile, okay? Because equality is breaking out. And guess what? You can't stop it. You can't stop it. There ain't enough bad in you. There ain't enough bad in you. And whoever you are, there ain't enough bad in you. You know why? Because you look at this screen and ain't no quit in us. <laughs> in us. We, we have done this all of our lives. We have had to fight like this all of our lives. And I say to people all the time when they say, well, it's going to be hard. Listen, hard I know, easy I'd have to learn. So don't come at me with, with hard. I just told you I'm a triad. I'm a triple threat. I'm a triple threat. So anybody who has any isms in their lives and they're afraid of it, they really start shaking in their boots when I walk in the room because I walk in the room and I walk in the room with, with the pride of my ancestors. I walk in the room with, with the fortitude of faith that I have. I walk into the room and say, I will not be treated unequally. I will not be treated as a second class citizen because I'm here. I paid my dues and I got my receipts. You want to know what my receipts are? My receipts are the scars that I, that I carry on my heart because I have been discriminated against. The receipts that I have are the scars that I carry for not just me, but for everyone everyone else that's in those categories who is always rejected and dejected. I carry those scars. Those are my receipts. And the other thing is my receipts are the way that I have been able to overcome the ignorance of all the isms that are in the world. So, there ain't that much bad in you and there ain't no quit in us. <laughs> Senator Spearman. And with that, I want to segue to the questions that we have from our attendees. So our first question I'm going to direct to Wendy Murphy. Um, so the question is, do we need to win the lawsuit for ratification? I understand that legislation for the removal of the expiration date is in the Senate for approval. What is the status of this? Yeah, really good question. So I think the answer is um, we have to hear from the courts first. And when the courts rule on our arguments, which are that um, the deadline is invalid, which means the ERA is valid, if we win that argument, there's no need to go to the Senate. So our view has been, uh, you can try the approach to going to Congress and seeing if they can retroactively remove the deadline, which I think is a very difficult argument that, that they probably won't win anyway in the courts. And what I mean by that is, even if the Senate does remove the deadline, um, that will itself be challenged in the courts. And I think it's a very tough argument. I don't think they'll prevail. However, you know, I'm open-minded about it. What I know is that we are now in the courts. And if we win in the courts, there's no need to go to Congress. So one step at a time. Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, our next question I'm going to direct towards State Senator Spearman. Senator, um, how would slash could the ERA impact slash support the LGBTQ plus community? Well, I, I think that uh, I've answered that, but let me reiterate it. Um, the ERA, applicable to me as a woman, is also applicable to me as a member of the LGBTQ community. And that's whether you call it LGBT, whether you call it queer, lesbian, it doesn't matter. You know, the alphabets don't matter because I am who I am. The alphabets are labels, but, but, but since you asked, it means that anyone like me will now be equal. And, 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 and it does not say in there that it excludes equality from coming, in, coming to fruition for anyone else. You know, there, there's one thing that I would, I would just uh, disagree, um, humbly with Wendy, and that is LGBT folks were around in the 1700s, they just didn't talk about it. Yeah. They, they, they didn't talk about it, but, but, but we, we've been here since the beginning of time. I mean, really, since the beginning of time. They were so, invisible, that was my point. Invisible, and they didn't, didn't want to act like, like we were here. And so, so the ERA, getting that ratified, really eliminates the last argument of why people should not be equal. It really does, because there, there has always, for centuries, there has always been this notion that women are supposed to walk five steps behind the man, and she's not smart enough to be able to do anything except have babies. So the, I fight for the ERA because I'm a triple threat. <laughs> somebody, somebody write that down. Put it on a t-shirt. Kamala, can you put that on a t-shirt? I'm a triple yeah. threat. <laughs> yes. And a unicorn, remember? <laughs> yeah. 
I'm going to open to the, open the floor to everyone for this next question. So how can we get the ERA as a topic for the November elections and get people to vote for pro ERA candidates? Uh, so let me start. Do exactly what you said. Ask people, do you support it? Will you say that publicly? Will you put that on your platform? And if you can't support it, then guess what? We can't support you either. We can't support you either because people who will not support the Equal Rights Amendment, there are some other levels of equality that they will not be able to support either. Or they are so beholden to the hetero patriarchal Aryan uh, thought process and cannot free themselves, they won't, they won't do it anyway, even if you elect them. If they do the North-South nod, they still won't do it. So ask people specifically. When I ran for re-election in 2016, I ran on ratifying the ERA. That was my number one message. I said, re-elect me, and when I get back to the state Senate, I will make sure we ratify the ERA. And in Virginia, you saw people do the same thing. They, the people who were running and those who were running against some people who were, were, had been in office so long, they thought that there was no way that they could get them out. But when you start talking about equality, remember I said equality is breaking out everywhere. And pe people keep popping up, you know, it's a whack-a-mole. Trying to stop it, you can't stop it. You can't stop it. All over the world, equality is breaking out. Vote for people, ask them, do you support equality? If you don't support equality, I can't support you. And, and, and I would take it a little bit further, um, Kat, because I'm, a, I'm an issue voter. I am a fierce nonpartisan. I will vote for whoever um, prioritizes equality because equality first, everything else second. Equality first and all the other problems um, will, will, will be healed to some extent. I mean, a lot of the issues that politicians talk about, equal pay and all this silliness, um, you can never, ever, ever give women equal pay unless they have equality at the constitutional baseline, period. There is no equal pay without ERA because when you go to court, to complain that your pay is not equal and all you cite is a statute, you lose because the statute gets construed under the Constitution and the Constitution doesn't give you that equal enforcement power that you need. So for me, as an issue voter, um, I'm very clear. It's not just, do you believe in equality? Because any politician will say yes to that. No politician will say, oh, I'm racist, oh, I'm sexist. They're not stupid. You have to say, will you prioritize ERA as the number one issue for women in your campaign? If the answer is not yes, you don't get my vote. That's my rule. It's not just that you believe in it, that it's somewhere buried in your platform. It has to be your number one priority for women, equality first, everything else second. That's what I say to every politician. And I don't care if you're the dog catcher or the president. I'm a one issue voter. Until we get equality, that's the only thing I vote for, and by the way, that's what women did with suffrage. That's how they won suffrage. It's not that they voted for it, it's that they became a one issue group of people. Suffrage, suffrage, suffrage. They united around it, they made it their one issue platform when they created the Women's Party. It was the only thing they fought for and that's why they won it. We need to do that for the ERA as well. So I wanna say that um, a few years ago, Equal Means Equal wrote up an equality pledge and we sent it out to all 50 states. And we uh, encourage you, we will provide it uh, to you if anybody wants it. What it is, is um, it basically states, if you are an incumbent and ERA legislation comes before you, you commit to vote yes. If you are a candidate and you uh, get elected, you commit to vote yes. And what that does is it provides you with the way to count your votes, right? And as a sort of reward for doing that, what we've done, we did this in Arizona, is we took out a full page ad in the newspaper saying, you know, if you're a woman, um, look at the, can the people that are pro ERA and only vote for them. And so I advise people in other states where the ERA is not ratified to do an equality pledge. And again, we can give them to you or they're very easy and just count who is, is doing that and do that now because by the time November comes around, October, you wanna be doing ads going, Joe Schmo is against equality. 
And in order to do that, you need to know who Joe Schmo is right now. So that's a, a, an easy way that you can start doing um, vote counting on ERA. And I want to just say that although we do have the 38 states, I encourage all the women in all the unratified states to push through and ratify. Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, we need you um, to ratify because God forbid, and I know, you know, this is a really horrible long shot, but God forbid they find a way to say that rescissions count, which would be such a, a Pandora's box of horrors. I don't think they will. But if they do, there are five states that presently want to retract their ratification. So why don't we just get all 50 states? You know what I mean? Why don't we just get them all so we don't have to deal with this kind of crap all the time? Because what, I re what really upsets me is how they take something so huge and basic, which is equality, which is something we were born with, and they start to parse it out into little sentences and little bullshit until you don't end up with equality. And that is where we need to keep, and I know both Wendy represents the legal um, space in which they have so many words for so much crap that, that basically ends up just being confusing. And politicians, which is the sphere, the sphere that God bless Pat Spearman, she swims in, where they'll just lie to your face. They will lie to your face. So we just have to get ourselves together and do what we did in all the states, which is organize, mobilize, and pressure these guys. And if they don't commit to voting ERA publicly, they're gone. They're gone. Goodbye. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, everyone. So we're going to go to our last question, and I'll open the floor to everyone here. Elise Smeal recently said that one of the main reasons that the ERA has not been certified is that women do not have power in the U.S. How do we get the power to get the ERA ratified and to be final? I disagree with Ellie Smeal. I think we have huge amounts of power. For one thing, we're the majority of the population. If that isn't power, what, where our problem is, um, you know, we do, we are out of, it's out of balance. There's no area in society in which we even have 30% participation. So it is a problem, but look at Nevada. Nevada is a perfect example of taking, um, women putting them into a space and they fix that space and it ripples outward. Nevada is the first ever state legislature to be majority female and look what came out. The, 30, the 36th state after, I don't know, 40 years? So we've got the power. The thing, and we need to let them know that we know it. The problem is that we think we don't have it and they know that and they distract us with all the things we're supposed to be worried about, like having d armpits that are, you know, apparently too dark or whatever they're telling us to worry about. We should stop worrying about it and say, you know what? We're not, you know, the next thing is, is if the Supreme Court denies us the equal rights, there has to be a women's strike. That means you don't work, you don't go to take your kids to school, you don't do anything because they need to understand that we do have the power and ellie smeal needs to understand that we do have the power let me add one, prove that let me say one other thing about this um i think the labor union experience in this country is very instructive uh they know about the value of unity uh various social groups understand the power of unity and focus and women have not um, done that. We don't have good leadership in this country when it comes to women's rights. Most of the mainstream establishment groups are either ineffective or, or in my opinion, working against our interests. It's, it's, you know, it's a sort of predictable, when you look at the history of social movements, groups that are rising up often become corrupt and co-opted, and I think that has happened in this country, and s some of the most well-known women's groups have become corrupted and co-opted, and they're just not helping. I'll use Ellie as an example. Um, you know, I know she's been around for a long time. 
uh, we've got this incredibly important lawsuit pending, the only lawsuit filed by women for women in Massachusetts federal court. She's not helping us. Her group is not helping us. They've done- Even this Gloria Steinem. Gloria Steinem- She's in has- Mrs. America. She wouldn't come on these seminars. She's in my film. She is the ERA for a lot of people. Where is she right now? Well, where is, the, I think the important thing is rather than just singling these individuals out, just point out that there are a lot of women and groups that seem to have either the, in, the interests of women uh, at the core of their mission, whether it's for Title IX or ERA, but if you really look at what they're doing, they do not support women's equality. They do not advocate for fully equal treatment of women. They're in the courts asking for second class treatment of women. I've been involved in these cases. I can share that with you. Anyone who wants to know, just let just email me and I'll tell you which groups in this country have actually been involved in the courts fighting against the equal treatment of women, but they're asking you to give them money to help them fight for women's equality. It is that bad in this country. In my view, the, the answer to the question is simple. We need to unite unapologetically around this issue and nothing else period, end of discussion. And if we never get Oprah Winfrey and Gloria Steinem and all these people on our side, that's okay. Because when we can't have one powerful person, we can have power in numbers. What we need is leadership and unity, and we will prevail. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and let me, let me say this. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what Ellie meant when she said that, but let me rephrase it. Um, we have to have visible power. We have to have visible power. Um, I did not finish undergrad because I didn't think I had power to succeed. I didn't get my master's because I didn't think I had power. I, I, I got those two degrees and oh, by the way, I was among the first women to be uh, directly branched into a combat support uh, arm of the military. And I was able to achieve, to, to go through almost 30 years and achieve the rank of Lieutenant Colonel because I had power. And it wasn't just that I had power, I had to show that power. Because keep in mind, when people look at me, I represent three of the things that people hate the most. People who are prejudiced and want to dwell in bigotry, I represent all of that for them. And so, I don't know so much as that we don't have power. I think what we've got to do is begin to show that power. And when we show that power, sometimes we show that power in different ways. Um, I show my power in one way, someone else shows their power in another way, and someone else, but it's going to take all of us working in however we can work to bring this to fruition. Uh, one of the things that being in the military taught me is that we've got something called combined armed support. And what that means is you get you have some people who are are proficient in the air war. You have some people who are infantry people. You have some people who are artillery. You have some people who are tankers. You have people who are, are medics. You have people who are military police. You have people who are logisticians. But it takes all of those uh, military specialties in order to win a war, in order to be successful in any campaign. And so here's what I would say. I would say for all of us, let's join together so that we can be successful. Because remember, if, if anyone can get us to stand against anyone else in this movement, they've won. But when we stand and we say, I may not agree with that, but guess what? They're going to fight the fight that they can fight. I'm going to fight the fight that I can fight. But together, we will win the fight. And so for me, again, it's not so much that we don't have power is that we do not operationalize that power. And, and to go back to Kamala's point, in 2018, um, I wasn't on the ballot. I am this time, I'm up for re-election, 2020, up for re-election. Please go to my website, Spearman 4 Nevada, Spearman the number four Nevada, uh, and, and, and take, a, take a look, check me out, and you'll know why I'm so feisty. Uh, so here's what we did in 2018. We knew that we were very, very close to having a female majority. And we knew that the candidates that we had on the ballot for either election or re-election were competent and were capable. And so when I was out asking people to vote for my then, my now colleagues, 
I said to them, not only are they capable to do this, this, and this, but guess what? If we can elect these people, Nevada will become the very first state to have a female majority. You know what we did? People didn't talk about it a lot, but not only in 2019 were we the first state to have a female majority, but we also have a female majority on the Supreme Court. Hello. <laughs> That's right. We, yeah, we also have a female majority in our constitutional officers. And so when you put your mind to it and, 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 and competent and, and women who are running for office and you vote for them, this is what happens. This is what happens when women rule. When women rule, I know that it's not, it's not this way across the board for, uh, in, in terms of the constitutionality, as Wendy just said, but guess what, in Nevada, you can no longer pay people differently or less than just because of gender. That's a bill that I first started in 2015 and I had to carry it three sessions before it passed. In Nevada, if you are sexually assaulted and there's DNA involved, I don't care if it's 40 years later, you got the DNA, then there's no statute of limitations. This is what happens when women are in charge. When women are in charge, we recognize that it's important not to just have a 30 day supply uh, of birth control, but you got to, especially in the rural parts, you've got to make sure you have at least six months and ought to have a year. When women are in charge, we put into state statutes that it is your right to reproductive health and whatever that means for you. When women are in charge, this is what we did in terms of uh, making sure that victims had rights. A bill that I carried means that if someone recruits someone and they are a predator and they're in a position of power, guess what? I don't care whether this teacher, preacher, grocery store leader, I don't care who it is. If that is the case, when their case comes to court and if they are convicted, then there are enhanced penalties. This is what happens when women are in charge. My very first bill that I carried was a bill to include transgender persons in the hate crimes legislation, into that protected class of the hate crimes legislation. So you wanna know what happens when women are in charge? Go back and take a look at what we did in Nevada. And it wasn't that difficult for us to get to, for us to get buy-in across the aisle because when, when a bill came up that talked about sexual predators, when a, when a bill came up that talked about uh, uh, human trafficking, when a bill came up about equal pay, when a bill came up uh, uh, about, about uh, 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 child care, when a bill came up about, uh, came up, we didn't have to convince 70% of the legislature because most of us already understood why we needed those things to happen. And so it was really a matter of me going to not just my Democratic colleagues, but also to my Republican colleagues and saying, this is something that ought to happen. Don't you agree? Come on, co-sponsor this with me. So when women are in charge and we understand, now we've got some power and we're gonna get some things done. Just and remember, just I'm remember. Going back, I'm going back in 21 and we're gonna get some more stuff done. Just remember, Pat. .com. Remember, Pat. We don't want to vote for Phyllis Schlafly. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm, I'm saying, let me put it like this. Competent, caring, and sophisticated enough in their intellectual prowess, can I put it like that? That they understand that equality is there and they're not co-opted and bought out, you know, by a patriarchal, uh, hetero, Aryan uh, point of view. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And with that, I think it's a good place to close. We apologize for any of the questions that we obviously weren't able to get to. Thank you to our panelists and all those who joined us. These webinars are meant to elevate conversations around Mrs. America and the ERA and drive people to take action. And we will be emailing out a toolkit that has information on our panelists, works that they're leading, and calls to action for the ratification of the ERA. Also important to note is that we will be recording these and placing them on YouTube on Generation Ratify's channel to be watched again later and be shared with anyone who can't make it at the regular time. Our webinar series will continue on Thursdays from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, with the next one being on the topic of how to approach social media, filmmaking, and content production from a feminist perspective to create change. I hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.